Hi everyone, uh, welcome to your first lecture in uh, social psychology. Um, so my name is Joshua Quinlan. Um, I'm a researcher in, in social and personality psychology um, and I conduct research in uh, a variety of different um, uh, areas. Uh, one of my chief interests is in video games <clears throat> and understanding how video games can satisfy basic psychological needs. Um, but I also have a research background in uh, absurd humor and in um, literature and reading um, and uh, have a sort of a, <clears throat> a handful of other areas that I've dabbled in over the years um, so uh, I came to psychology and specifically social psychology um, by way of philosophy uh, I had always had a uh, an interest in, in philosophy and how it could be used to answer questions about the human experience and uh, existence but I found that often philosophy sort of hinted at um, psychological methods but never quite followed through on them and so uh, eventually it sort of led me to uh, psychology and you know here I, I found um, a certain satisfaction in the in the, the methodologies common in psychology and I found that it often answered tried to answer the same questions as philosophy but I found the answers somewhat more satisfying although I still do think philosophy holds a, a very important role both in general and for me personally um, and as I just referenced I uh, a lot of my uh, research interests are based in media in some way and so oftentimes the examples that I use in this uh, in these lectures will refer to philosophy or media or other sort of personal interests of mine um, and this is a way for me to try to make things um, kind of personalized to me as a lecturer so in other words I'm giving you a sort of curated um, uh, piece of information or, or set of information but also to make it more resonant with you hopefully um, and I'll, I'll try to use a variety of examples so that I can hopefully you know appeal to something you care about uh, somewhere um, <clears throat> so uh, one thing to note I guess, I guess a few housekeeping items before we actually um, uh, uh, dive into the lecture some of this may have been covered in the um, uh, sort of synchronous meeting that we have hopefully now already had you will have hopefully already attended it um, but I just want to kind of go over the relationship between uh, the textbook and my lectures and the evaluations in this course um, and that's the you know the the primary primary thing here is that I'm going to lecture for typically between an hour and two hours probably leaning closer to the latter than the former but you know different uh, each week um, but by necessity I will not be able to capture all of the information in the textbook the chapters are fairly long and fairly detailed and me reading the textbook to you would be I can guarantee you incredibly boring and I don't think very useful instead what I try to do with these lectures is to grab the information that I think is most interesting and most important and to emphasize it in a way that should help you learn the concepts better than if you had just read them sort of in um, isolated reading on your own and um, part of the reason I do this is um, like I said to help you learn those concepts the best um, or, or learn those concepts sort of more deeply um, but it's also because I uh, think that the information that I pull is usually the most important and if I think the information that I'm pulling is the most important that will likely be reflected on the evaluations in the course I will probably repeat this at some point if not multiple points throughout the course but 
you know, if I'm pulling information to discuss it in detail in a lecture, it's probably because I think that um, it's important to understand, and I'm going to evaluate you on that. That being said, you are still required to read the assigned chapters of the textbook, and you will be tested on the material in those assigned chapters. So, to sort of uh, summarize all that, the evaluations in this course will focus more on lecture material. That means the things that I pull from the textbook that I discuss, um, the, the topics from the textbook that I discuss are the things that I think are most important and therefore they'll be represented more strongly on the exam. It also means that if something is discussed in lecture and it's not uh, discussed in the textbook, it will be on, like, there's a strong chance it will be on the exam. Um, because there's lots of important things I think that the textbook does not cover. It also means that if something is covered in the textbook in one of the assigned chapters, but it's not covered explicitly in the lectures, it still is testable. It's just that I, um, you know, it wasn't the most important thing or one of the most important things or it didn't fit into the sort of story that I wanted to tell that week. Um, so you will be doing a fair amount of reading. I've actually reduced this reading considerably from other sections. Um, so you're doing less reading than, <laughs> than a lot of other students in, in this class, in this course, but other sections. Um, but you will be expected to, to sort of read these chapters and to have, you know, uh, learned something from them. And, um, I may have already talked about this sort of, uh, perspective a little bit in the um, uh, synchronous session, so apologies if I'm repeating myself. Um, but I, I I expect you to learn in this course. Um, I expect you to learn from my lectures. I expect you to learn from the textbook. Um, if you know when when we have guest speakers, which we will, um, I expect you to learn from them, and that means integrating the information that we provide. Um, whether or not you're going to be tested on it. Because you will be tested on some of it, hopefully most of it, but the point isn't for you to prove that you have uh, learned the things you'll be tested on. The point is that you're going to learn things, hopefully. Um, that is the actual goal here, not the, not the testing. Um, so try to keep that goal in mind when you approach all this, right? Um, you know, you're in school, you're in a place of higher learning. Um, try to try to learn something and if you successfully learn things you know from from the lectures from the textbook um, you should do well in the evaluations so keep in mind what the primary goal here is and then let that primary goal sort of lead naturally into uh, evaluation performance um, but yeah I mean you you will learn more than you'll be tested on by necessity that's how all courses work so try not to fight that just you know, accept that there's going to be a bit of reading in this class, accept that there's going to be a fair amount of information, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy it, and we'll, we'll all uh, have a good time, hopefully, uh, discussing this stuff. Um, and I guess one final housekeeping note, uh, you're going to want to take notes during these lectures. Um, I tend not to actually use that many slides. If I use a slide, I often jam it full of text, and that's great for you, but I talk a lot, uh, and if I say something during a lecture it's course material and I can guarantee you that not everything I say is <laughs> represented on um, the slides uh, so um, you should you should take notes uh, while you watch these lectures and you know you can always pause or rewind or slow down uh, so that's sort of uh, hopefully will make the note-taking process a little bit more simple um, okay, that's it for housekeeping. Um, that was a lot of housekeeping. I actually uh, probably won't ever have to do this again, uh, so we're not always going to have these <laughs> uh, kind of 10 minutes feels before the um, actual lecture begins. Usually it'll just, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, so today in this, in this first session, we're going to do a brief survey of what social psychology is and is not, um, and we're going to discuss some of the fundamental ideas and methodologies in social psychology. Um, after we have that uh, uh, discussion or, or, you know, monologue, um, sadly with these pre-recorded lectures, but um, 
after that, you're going to have a guest lecture, um, the first of a handful of guest lectures um, from Jessica Padgett. Um, she's a cultural psychologist here at York. Um, and cultural psychology is an extremely important area within psychology. But in my opinion, it doesn't quite get its sort of due in this textbook. Um, and for that reason, I'm, f I'm going to give you a a full uh, lecture on kind of an introduction to cultural psychology from an actual cultural psychologist. So I can at least give you that even if I can't give you sort of like a proper full chapter in the textbook, which I think would probably be warranted. Um, chapter two does cover cultural psychology in this textbook, which is why this lecture is going to kind of replace chapter two well, not replace, but represent chapter two, I should say, from lecture, lecture wise, but chapter two is still assigned. We're just going to sort of provide a fuller um, exposure to uh, cultural psychology. So those are the two lectures today. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, um, we can sort of get you off on the right foot here, inspire you to kind of develop an interest in social psychology, get you excited for the rest of this course, um, and also maybe get you excited about cultural psychology specifically, because we've got a great cultural psych course in the undergraduate program here at York. Uh, okay, let's go. So um, let's run through the learning objectives for this lecture. Um, first, you're go we're going to discuss uh, who or what is a social psychology, and so you hopefully should be able to have a decent answer to this at the uh, end of today's lecture. Um, and we're going to answer it by doing a brief survey of social psychology, um, and then an even briefer sort of historical trajectory of social psychology. After that, we're going to talk about some of the uh, major dominant ideologies and assumptions in social psychology. Um, and we're going to do that by talking about the major uh, analytical perspectives in modern social psych and the uh, sort of assumptions that define social psychology, that make something social psychological in nature, that, that make sort of, it's they're the je ne sais quoi of, uh, of social psychology. And then finally, we're going to talk about applying the scientific method in social psychology and what makes uh, social psychology unique in studying these social phenomena. Uh, we're going to do that by discussing an overview of the scientific method, and we're going to have a sort of a closer look at correlational ex and experimental methods and uh, discuss their application within social psychology. Okay. So social psychology is uh, the scientific study of people's thoughts feelings and behaviors um, regarding themselves and the actual imagined or implied presence uh, of others. And so if this were a live lecture, um, I would ask you to generate examples of, of what this is. Um, so maybe just take a second uh, while I drink some water and uh, ask yourself, uh, what do you think that this covers? And uh, what does it not cover? What, what counts as social psychology according to this definition and, and what doesn't? So hold on to um, those answers and sort of check in with yourself as we talk for the next few minutes um, and and sort of, you know, check with yourself. Do, do you think you got these answers right? Because unfortunately I can't tell you, but uh, you, you'll probably have a good idea by the time we, um, <laughs> you know, are a couple slides deep. Uh, so one thing that I'll draw attention to here is that um, psychology, social psychology is not just the study of sort of human interaction, you know, like two or more humans interacting with one another. Social psychology includes a lot of things that um, are kind of individual in nature um, because they regard in some way the actual, or sorry, the imagined or implied presence uh, of others. Um, and we'll talk more about what exactly that means a little bit later, um, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it because social psychology is not as simple as, you know, like 
uh, okay, how does one person behave in the, in the presence of another person? Um, it, it's, it's more nuanced than that and also more broad and vague than that. So one thing, to, uh, one, one way that we can learn about something is to um, ask who its friends are, what their dynamic is like with their friends. And social psychology has uh, a lot of friends. Um, you know, I guess you, if you ask different people, you'd get different answers about this, but my answer is philosophy, sociology, um, biology, political science, uh, among others. It has many friends, I think. Um, and I also think that it's friends with the entire spectrum of psychology, um, though perhaps with an especially close relationship with cognitive psychology. And um, when I say it has friends, I mean that often the topics covered in these different disciplines uh, are very similar or the same, um, but they differ in terms of theoretical lens or methodology, uh, the lines of argument that they approach, things like that. Uh, and it, it's worth noting that these, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're at odds. Um, all of these disciplines can coexist, um, and, and in my opinion should actually inform one another. Um, and you know, I use this term friends kind of just because I think it's funny, but it might actually be a bit of a misnomer <clears throat> because I I'm certain that not all psychologists see those other disciplines as being equally worthwhile. And I'm sure that some of the people in those other disciplines also don't necessarily regard psychology as being, you know, equal to their disciplines. But these days, I, I sort of get the feeling that academics are generally more receptive to the important contributions of these different intersecting disciplines. People are more kind of tolerant and respectful of, of, of the different disciplines and understanding of what their relative contributions are. Um, but the reason that they all, all these other disciplines intersect with social psychology so much uh, is because social psychology uh, subsumes a, a wealth of topics, a really wide range of topics. Everything from like emotion to cults to relationships to stress to reading and fashion like all of these things can fall under the domain of social psychology, but not exclusively under social psychology, but you know, social psychology is interested in them. Uh, in fact, like think back to your answer earlier, what isn't to what isn't social psychology. Um, and you know, ask yourself now, is that definitely not social psychology? Not even conceivably, maybe because it, kind of sometimes does actually feel like everything might potentially be under the domain of interest at least for social psychology um i, I do think it's kind of difficult to come up with i wish we were live so i could um uh, ask you to generate examples because i'm curious as to what people would, would generate but um you know uh, uh with with regards to humans at least and human behavior and human perception and human cognition and and so on I, I do think that social psychology is interested in uh, a lot of this stuff and I think it's important to point this out because um, as you probably know this is true of every undergraduate course we won't be able to cover all of social psychology in this course you know we're gonna actually going to cover like a tiny, tiny sliver of it um, by necessity. And that sliver uh, isn't even necessarily the most important bits because different people have different ideas about what the most important bits of social psychology are. Um, what we are going to cover is primarily material that is in this textbook that we happen to be using. Um, it's primarily material from the textbook that I think is interesting and important, and it's going to be supplemented with additional information that I kind of like bring in to the lectures, just because I think it's important and interesting or fun or entertaining. Um, and like collectively, this is all going to help you get your feet wet in social psychology, um, and, and hopefully it's going to help you become kind of fluent in the basic ideas of social psychology, the style of thinking in social psychology the sort of way in which we think in social psychological terms. Um, but, you know, it's not going to, you're not going to be a master of the content of, uh, of social psychology. And research is constantly updating itself too, so even that knowledge is, would be, you know, even if you could learn all of it, some of it would be wrong in a couple of years, you know? So just 
due to the way that science progresses. Um, and I guess the sort of the last thing I'll say on this topic, uh, for the sake of this course, um, we're going to assume that the textbook is quote unquote correct. Um, which is to say that you should read the textbook, as I talked about earlier, um, and you should process and learn its information, and you should get used to thinking about the ideas that it, it presents. Um, and I think that reading that textbook is going to be sort of a, a useful exercise in that regard. Um, but I will point out now that the textbook does make decisions about what is important in social psychology. It is not objective. Uh, we're going to we're going to deal with that word later in the semester. Um, but, you know, the, the authors of this textbook made decisions about what to put in this textbook, uh, and those decisions represent values uh, <laughs> on behalf of the authors. Uh, and furthermore, I made even more decisions about what information from that textbook, and sort of from my own expertise, to include or exclude. And I'm also not objective. I also made value judgments here. I made decisions based on my own beliefs, preferences, attitudes, values, whatever. So what you're going to learn this semester is a very biased sample of social psychology. And that sample was sort of selected based on these value judgments from the textbook authors first, maybe even from the publisher of the textbook, um, from the editors of the textbook, and then from the instructor, me, and, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, so this is actually maybe sort of secretly your first lesson in social psychology, um, is is learning about uh, the, the kind of biased way that um, s even academic information and educational information gets transmitted. Um, and, you know, maybe you've thought about this uh, topic before, maybe you haven't, but it's worth pointing out that when I say all this, you know, it's not just true of this course and, and me and this textbook. It's true for every course and every instructor and every textbook, right? Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave this now. I talk actually about this idea in much more explicit detail uh, later on in the course and kind of throughout the course because turns out bias is an important component of, uh, of social psychology. Um, but, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Um, so you might also be wondering, uh, what does social psychology do? Uh, and this answer is simultaneously simple uh, and difficult, like many of the questions that I will present to you throughout this course. Uh, and the simple answer is just that it uses a set of research methodologies and theoretical lenses to scientifically answer questions about human behavior and cognition. Um, but what are those methodologies and how do we formulate those answers? what does this research actually look like? And it turns out that its content varies. Um, and, you know, as the content varies, so too do the methodologies that we use. Um, social psychology research can include um, surveys, uh, you know, asking people sort of a set of questionnaires on paper or on a computer. Um, experiments, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these later. Uh, psychophysiological methods so this can include things this is like ways of assessing uh, psychological states by using physiological indices um, so this could be like galvanic skin response which is sort of like looking at how much um, sweat and um, uh, arousal is sort of happening at the skin level um, so basically it's using physiological measures to infer psychological states um, neurological uh, methods. So this would be assessing the brain in order to uh, make inferences about the psychological state or the neurological processes underlying psychological states. Um, field studies. So this is where you go into the real wor world without disturbing the real world and um, kind of studying it as it exists. Archival studies. This is when you collect data um, that already sort of exists in the world without necessarily going to... Um, uh, collected directly from participants or interacting with participants directly. So this would be like um, going on old internet forums, for example, or uh, going through the uh, census, like old census data. 
um, natural language processing. Um, so this is when you take a uh, piece of text um, and you use various analytical methods for um, developing a more systematic understanding of what's going on at the linguistic level. Um, so for example, in my lab, we've done this uh, with books. Um, we've done this with tweets. We've done it with forum posts, like on Reddit. Um, meta research, this isn't really a term that gets used, but I'm kind of just referring to the idea of studying research, um, running research on research. Um, this isn't really something we're going to talk about because it's kind of an advanced idea, um, but it's sort of like developing a more mm, stable understanding of a set of uh, research um, and understanding sort of the... the Make, uh, developing a new understanding of all of that research combined. Um, yeah, don't worry if you don't understand that. That's not um, an important sort of topic right now. Um, and so on. There, <laughs> there are um, many other uh, uh, sort of methodologies that can be used in, in, in social psychology. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, so to answer the question, I guess, what does psychology do? The answer is a lot and a lot of different things. And we've already kind of implied an answer to this question, but uh, who is social psychology? And the boring answer to this is, of course, that they're trained scientists. They usually have a PhD. They usually conduct research within the context of a university. That doesn't necessarily mean they con conduct research in the university on university students. It just means that they're usually employed by a university. Um, but that conception of psychology is actually only a couple hundred years old maximum really um, in truth sci social psychological investigations are kind of as old as human civil civilization like our oldest pieces of literature the oldest ones that that we know of um, still contemplate human nature and ask questions about what we do and why we do it and we have philosophers who've devoted themselves to these questions from thousands and thousands of years ago and in various civilizations be it confucius or to Aristotle, right? Um, and so, you know, that all might lead you to ask, when is social psychology? And I've, I've kind of just given you the answer, but like, for our class, it's 20th and 21st centuries, because that's mostly what we'll be talking about in terms of like, the modern conception of uh, a scientific approach to social psychological investigations. Um, but I do kind of want to just briefly note that you know it's not like uh, a couple of Germans uh, in the 19th century were the first people to um, come up with the idea of, of asking questions about you know human nature and human behavior and so on um, th these are just as old as people are and anywhere you've had people they've been wondering these same things it's just that this sort of scientific um, application uh, to, to these questions is uh, relatively modern. So now that we've learned a little bit about uh, what psychology might be, uh, let's go over kind of a very brief modern history of how it's been deployed. Um, I will note again, sorry, I'm gonna sound sort of like a broken record here, but um, I think it's an important thing to stress. The, that the act of sketching a history is inherently biased. Um, we have decided what events to include and what to omit, which trends to highlight and which to de-emphasize. Uh, you're going to notice that this history is curiously Western and Anglo-centric. Um, you know, how, <laughs> how funny. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm just pointing that out that, like, um, uh, when you sketch a history and any you know historian uh worth their salt will tell you this as well but uh when you sketch a history you are uh making a bias selection uh and you're telling us sort of a story um and your bias bleeds into that story and that's true here too but you know we're gonna follow the textbook's lead uh and we're gonna sort of follow the the history that they sketch and the first sort of trend within social psychology that they um, identify is 
um, what they call an instinct-based uh, or evolutionary sort of perspective. And this proposes that human behavior is driven chiefly by instinct, um, just like an the animals that have um, sort of less complex cognitive systems than ours. Um, they are, you know, th this idea supposes that humans are uh, driven primarily by the instincts um, that were endowed to us by natural selection and the ones that sort of allow us to ensure our survival and ensure uh, the survival of our typically children. Um, and building off of that work, uh, but sort of adding some nuance, recognizing the complexities and the variability in human behavior, Freud and his ilk, his kind of descendants, the, the Neo-Freudians, um, they propose that natural selection did endow us with these instincts, um, but that those instincts often need to be suppressed in order to, or repressed, to use the sort of Freudian term, um, in order to maintain social cohesion. And so these repressed instincts, um, primarily sexual or aggressive in nature, those are the ones that Freud was most interested in, they emerge in these surprising ways that we're not sort of consciously able to connect to their origins. In other words, we don't recognize that um, uh, the, the, the way that they sort of emerge, uh, we don't recognize that those behaviors are linked to repressed sexual urges, for example, or repressed uh, uh, urges towards violence or aggression. Um, I'm not gonna get into it any more deeply than that because uh, this isn't really a, uh, an important area of this course and you're not going to be tested on the sort of like nitty gritty details of Freud. You might have already learned that in intro psych and if you didn't, that's fine too. Um, but the, the sort of important bit here is that Freud is arguing that a substantial amount of the human experience is unconscious uh, and that our conscious mind might not have access to that unconscious even though the unconscious is having a considerable effect on our behavior, on our thoughts, on our emotions. So that's the sort of notable bit here, and it's the bit that we're going to kind of see um, uh, reacted to in, in the history of social psychology and also maybe revived later on. Uh, and so re in response to this idea, the behaviorists propose that um, actually behavior is uh, chiefly the result of kind of these simple maxims about learning. Basically, the idea that, you know, you, you're probably familiar with this idea is that actions that are followed by favorable outcomes are more likely to reoccur, whereas actions uh, that are followed by unfavorable outcomes are less likely to reoccur. And I'm just gonna sort of restate that in case it's not clear. If you do something and you are, uh, you are rewarded in some way afterwards, then that behavior is reinforced. It means it's uh, more likely to uh, present itself again in the future. And if you do something and you are punished uh, in some way, you are uh, less likely to do that behavior in the future. Uh, I don't know how much you have all learned about um, uh, behaviorisms and this sort of like major concepts in behaviorism uh, I'm almost tempted to get into them now <laughs> uh, on a tangent but I won't for the sake of uh, not confusing things further um, uh, but uh, behaviorism is, is very interesting and if you can take a class in learning the, the sort of major ideas in, in behaviorism um, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's quite neat um, in, in the learning class that I took in my undergraduate degree um, we had an extended example where our prof uh, taught us about how you would train a cat to use a toilet instead of a litter box um, and told us a real story about seeing that happen in uh, her real life um, but you know you'll have to take the learning course maybe to, to, to find out about that uh, so the, the most the, the most famous behaviorists are um, John Watson and B.F. Skinner and the sort of hardcore among the behaviorists they suggested that the human mind was kind of nothing more than a fantasy for psychologists to chase uh, and that they were kind of 
sort of a dream or a distraction from the important thing, which is behavior. They think that because the mind is not directly observable, nothing can be learned from it. And instead, they suppose, the psychologist should only ever study observable human behavior. And um, sort of in response to that, or sort of emerging out of that, finally, we have the paradigm that we arguably still inhabit, which is the kind of cognitive paradigm. So sort of since the 1970s, 1980s, we sort of collectively recognize that the mind is not directly observable, that's true, but that it can and should still be studied. Um, there are many things that we can glean from observing behavior directly, but like kind of the broadest expanses of human experience are really just in the mind. Uh, and if we ever hope to understand all these important things like emotions and attitudes and beliefs and persuasion and love and hate and whatever, we have to turn our gaze towards the mind and later on the brain. Uh, so in particular, the social cognitive perspective kind of sees us as a social information processing machine. Um, so it sort of sees in that individuals perceive and process, interpret and recall events, information, individuals from the environment, um, including themselves. And that if we, as psychologists, focus on these processes, um, they can teach us about the human mind and, uh, and, and human behavior. Uh, so ho hopefully that's sort of clear, the, 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 the difference there, right? That like basically behaviorists sort of say, okay, let's only study what's directly observable. Behavior, let's ignore the mind. Cognitive, sort of cognitive trend says to them, yes, you're right. The mind is not directly observable, but we have to find a way to indirectly observe it so that we can study all these great important social psychological concepts or psychological concepts in general. Um, one, one last thing to note is that uh, I'm sort of describing all these trends in this, in this very kind of neat separate way, but of course that's not how humans work. That's not how history works. That's not how ideologies work. Um, none of these perspectives or trends are right or wrong per se. Uh, and they also don't like cleanly separate. Uh, these are all ideological trends that clearly intersect and overlap and weave throughout one another and through different thinkers. And, you know, it's not as if one day everyone went to bed as behaviorists and the next day they woke up as sort of cognitive thinkers. Many people in the behaviorist movement, I'm sure, recognized, or during the behaviorist era at least, recognized the importance of the mind, of course, right? And furthermore, it's not as if any of them is correct. Like, none of these trends can be right. They're just different popular ways of thinking that kind of come and go in terms of popularity. And they all still have influence today. And they're all sort of correct in their own right. Um, I guess the psychoanalytic tradition, this kind of, these Freudian ideas, are the maybe the most incorrect if you want to put it that way um of, of all the ones that i've presented here um but its influences still can be traced throughout history and and you, you just sort of felt today even though i would say it's more subtle than the other ones um you know i, I guess what i'm saying is that like don't think of this in to, to, to use a sort of a historical term don't think of this as a wig history where everything um, progresses towards a better and better outcome. That's not really the way history works, even though sometimes we tell a story as if that's how it works. Rather, just try and understand these as ideological trends that existed in a uh, sort of a scientific culture um, and, and try to understand how that culture progressed and uh, how it leads into what we have today. And speaking of what we have today, uh, we now see that these past ideological trends 
have kind of transformed and emerged as these like novel perspectives that inform how we study uh, social psychological phenomena. Um, and along the way, we've kind of developed a couple of new ones as well. The textbook proposes that there are five of these perspectives. I think you could argue that there are more than five or fewer than five. Five seems like an arbitrary number, but sure, it's a fine place for us to start. It doesn't really matter. The point here is to give you an exposure to some of the modern popular perspectives in social psychology. And the first is the cognitive perspective, which we just described. Um, I'm not going to go into that again because you know I think we covered it in pretty great detail. The next is the evolutionary perspective. I spoke about this a little bit before. Uh, it's sort of the instinct-based one, the you know, evolutionary-based uh, kind of early idea about what causes uh, human behavior. Uh, and the, the sort of modern version of this attempts to understand human behavior, cognition, emotions, um, as being the result of natural selection. So, in other words, there are the adaptations that we kept around um, because of how they can encourage biological fitness. And biological fitness is the survival for us and our children, basically, for our, the survival of us and our genetic material. Um, and this perspective is kind of more or less popular depending on who you ask and where you are. To me, if you're asking for my opinion, it seems like it's becoming less popular and I think that's because of how much it kind of has to strain itself to explain like basic and obvious human behaviors. And it certainly still has its useful applications, but it feels like it has sort of limited utility as a primary framework. Um, so, you know, if I could just sort of try to, I, I'm not an expert on evolutionary psychology. I don't really try to be. It's not, it's not like a major area of interest for me. But if I could explain this in, in sort of using an example, you know, I think that evolutionary psychologists probably do have an answer for um, why there are so many people uh, who engage in uh, relationship and sexual pursuits that will never end in reproduction. Um, so, you know, be it gay or something else, there's quite a lot of behavior that <laughs> uh, seems to pretty seriously contradict any idea of reproduction. Um, and I, I do think evolutionary psychologists have an answer to this. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that they would, like, you know, have developed answers for this. But I've never heard one that was particularly compelling. It always felt sort of like cope to me. You know, it felt like uh, they were trying to ensure that this theoretical lens remained suitable. Um, but I do think that it does have some useful applications. I think that oftentimes... Um, it can explain things like sex differences, um, like differences between um, uh, male and female, the sexes. We're actually going to talk about that in uh, much greater detail later on in the semester, so forget that for now. Um, but, you know, it, I, I guess my point is that it, it has its utility, but it kind of feels to me sometimes like it's uh, maybe in a lesser popular mode right now. Okay, let's move on. The third perspective is the neuroscientific perspective. Um, and this is the idea that we can measure and assess the brain in order to understand the neural processes that underlie all the like neat social phenomena, like behaviors, cognitions, emotions, so on. And this perspective is inherently limited by the technological advances that enable it. And so as those technological advances happen, as that technology improves, as it becomes more accessible, the perspective becomes more popular, as you might imagine. So over the past 30 years, for example, um, it's become more and more popular, more and more common. Um, and, uh, you know, it's neat. It's It requires you to um, do quite a lot of work. It's difficult work to do, and it's uh, difficult to study, but uh, it offers something that, you know, a someone who doesn't do uh, doesn't have that neuroscientific perspective would never be able to access. It's totally unique. So uh, in that regard, it's it's um, very valuable. It, it's irreplaceable, really. Um, next is the cultural perspective, 
And this is the perspective that emphasizes, obviously, the importance of culture. And culture, at its highest level, is the symbolic conception of reality that we sort of cooperatively construct uh, among groups. Um, cultural psychologists focus on studying these constructions and understanding um, how they're created, how they can be changed, how they differ between groups, uh, and kind of how these constructions can interact with other social psychological faculties in order to, you know, produce behavior, cognition, and emotion. That's sort of all I'll say about that for now because you're going to get a full lecture on, um, or, you know, half a lecture, I guess, on cultural psychology uh, after we finish this introduction. Um, and... Uh, the final um, perspective that we're going to talk about is the existential perspective. And this perspective focuses on the influence of certain like philosophical adjacent concepts like meaning and meaninglessness and chaos and uncertainty and the sort of ever looming threat of death, which is called mortality salience in the, uh, in the literature. And we're sort of going to talk about this concept, I think, a little bit more today, but throughout the semester, and it gets dis discussed um, in the textbook quite a bit. Um, but I'll just kind of mention here that the, the, the textbook authors are kind of tipping their hand a little bit um, with this uh, perspective. I don't think that most social psychologists would list this existential existential perspective as one of the dominant perspectives in social psychology but do you know who would list that as one of the dominant perspectives in, in social psychology someone who focuses on this perspective in their work i will say that i do actually use this perspective in my own research um i uh think a lot about meaninglessness and uncertainty um, in sort of various strains of my own work um, and also think it's a super interesting topic but I wouldn't necessarily consider it to be one of the dominant perspectives in our field regardless it's an important one and in my opinion a very interesting one so I'll sort of mention that remind you of this kind of bias idea and then I'll leave it there because we are going to talk about this more over the course of the semester, both the ideas in the existential perspective, because they're going to come out, th come up throughout the textbook and throughout the lectures and the idea that perhaps the inclusion of it in a textbook is a demonstration of some of the, <laughs> some of the social psychological concepts that we're going to learn over the semester. So I'll leave it there. One last thing I'll say on this topic. These perspectives are not contradictory. They're not at odds with one another. Someone who's interested in understanding the responses to meaningless and uncertainty, they might bring in a neuroscientific perspective and neuroscientific methods. Um, and of course, as I kind of alluded to earlier, no study can rightfully ignore the importance of culture, though many do try to do that. No one is right to ignore uh, the cultural perspective. It's always relevant. So hopefully I haven't given you the impression that these are like competing schools of thought. They're not. Um, they're simply some of the major kind of ways of thinking in psychology. You can use more than one at a time. You can kind of integrate them and flexibly use them. You know, they're not, these aren't like, the different houses in Hogwarts or whatever. They're, they're, they sort of overlap and they play nice with one another. Okay, so now that we understand some of the major ideological perspectives in social psychology, let's talk about what we can all sort of agree on. The, the kind of handful of assumptions in social psychology that we all basically endorse and that we kind of tacitly acknowledge in our work. Um, these assumptions tend to underlie the way in which we formulate our research questions and the way in which we formulate the answers to those questions. It's kind of like the glue that holds social psychology together and like maintains it as a distinct discipline, like distinct from other disciplines. Um, so the first of these assumptions is that behavior is the product of the person and the situation. This is in some ways um, the most critical idea that social psychology has to offer. 
And it's basically that in order to understand social phenomena, it's crucial for us to study both the individual who produces that behavior and the environment in which it is produced. So, for example, anger is unlikely to emerge kind of just unprovoked on its own, right? Something in your environment is going to stimulate it. It might be like stepping on your little brother's Lego or like seeing that you left on the TV or whatever, but some aspect of your environment did produce that emotion. Um, now, of course, we know that not every person is going to like react to that situation the same way. Uh, and uh, many of us you know like wouldn't get angry at our little brother no matter what little annoying thing he did right like those sorts of people are not they're just simply not prone to anger and so in that way the individual is relevant there's a sort of an interaction between the environment and the individual to produce a uh, psychological phenomena um the one last wrinkle that i'll, that I'll sort of um provide here is that uh when i say environment or situation you have to be a little bit flexible with these terms uh, because situation could include something in your head um, like uh, low self-esteem for example so low self-esteem could be in this in this sort of uh, context it's the situation and then the person determines how you react to that low self-esteem so, for example, some people react to low self-esteem by feeling like, uh, by becoming more introverted, by sort of withdrawing into themselves. That might be a common uh, response to, uh, to, to, to low self-esteem. So, in that case, the behavior uh, is uh, withdrawing into yourself and it's being produced by low self-esteem, the situation and the person um however that same situation low self-esteem in a different person might produce a different behavior so for example people who are uh, uh vulnerable narcissists i think it's called or insecure narcissists this is one of the two types of narcissism um the other type is grandiose uh, uh people with this form of narcissism might re react to their low self-esteem by becoming uh, incredibly boisterous, not withdrawing into themselves at all, but actually like acting outwards, becoming sort of aggressive and um, you know, sort of bragging a lot and being really kind of performatively impressed with themselves. Uh, and so in this regard, the, uh, you know, the person has interacted with the same situation to produce a different behavior. Um, and like I said, this is the sort of core the corest of core ideas in uh in social psychology recognizing the power of the situation and the way that it interacts with the person the next assumption is that um nearly every aspect of uh of the human experience is, is social in nature in some way even when we're alone even when we experience things as isolated individuals we still kind of like process that information um, and, and relate to it in ways that are socially based. So, you know, for example, the experience of having low self-esteem is likely a, uh, a sort of an isolated or an individual experience, right? But it, it's sort of defined socially. It's defined by how you compare yourself to others. It's defined by how you think others perceive you and think about you. It's, or it's defined by what you think your value is to the group or to other people. Um, what you think uh, your sort of performance is going to be able to provide for you. Like, like you know, be it relationships or money or glory or control or whatever right the point is that like even things that are primarily experienced individually are still social in nature because of how dominantly social humans are uh and it means that nearly every experience that we have nearly sort of every piece of information that we have 
flowing through our little brains is um, sort of based in social uh, in the social context in some way related to that the third assumption is that um, our behavior is heavily influenced uh, by the kind of um, social cognitive idea or uh, sort of social cognitive information um, which is to say our understanding uh, of others and how we think that they uh, understand us um, so for example um, we might react to uh, the same behavior um, based on how we perceive the other person um, to have acted like like their their uh, intentions um, so if our uh, you know mom bumps into us if, if your mom bumps into you you probably know that your mom didn't do it intentionally and you probably won't snap at her hopefully um, you'll, you'll just say like oops excuse me or whatever um, but if your little brother is like uh, typically like clumsy or just like doesn't pay attention or whatever and he bumps into you you might snap and say like <laughs> leave me alone or get out of here or whatever um, because you're sort of perceiving his intentions differently or the way that you sort of understand him influences your behavior and your response to him you react with aggression rather than sort of you know forgiveness or grace or whatever right um, th you know th this is like uh, we're going to talk about this more and like this this sort of assumption is going to be like woven throughout the rest of the semester so and this is true for all this the 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 assumptions really like don't worry too much if you're not a hundred percent clear on them yet the textbook reading should help and and also like the, this information runs throughout uh, everything we're going to talk about all semester so you know don't worry about it too much and then the, the the fourth and the final assumption is that the scientific method is the sort of best tool that we have for understanding social phenomena. Um, so this assumption acknowledges that there are other disciplines studying those same phenomena as us, but it insists that the scientific method is the optimal way to do this. I would personally soften this assumption somewhat. This is what the textbook presents, right? Um, but for me, um, I think I would be a little bit softer on it because I don't think that every social psychologist necessarily fully endorses this. And I, I, you know, I don't necessarily fully endorse it. I think that there are many ways to study human behavior, the mind, our feelings, our thoughts, whatever. And the many different ways have various strengths and various weaknesses. And I'm not so confident as to say that the scientific method is the best way. It's the best way for some things for sure. Um, but different people have different goals. Uh, understanding, like like if that's your goal is to understand, that actually means different things for different people and for different phenomena. It's possible that a song or a drawing or a philosophical manuscript or a sociological autoethnography can capture and convey understandings of humanity that scientists could never hope to produce. Maybe right it's i mean they're still doing this they're still trying to understand social phenomena and human nature and behaviors and thoughts and emotions and so on um so yeah you know I, I do think that like there's a lot of information that science can produce that those other methods never could right it's not like science is not useful or something Science is certainly my preferred method. The scientific method is my preferred method, and I think it has a lot to offer our understanding uh, of social phenomena. But it's not the only way, and I think saying it's the best way might be a little bit presumptuous. Um, but regardless, you know, let's start there. Let's start with the uh, scientific method and using it to understand social phenomena. Um, but yeah, so you'll see these assumptions kind of pop up throughout the semester. I, I mentioned this a second ago, but um, from here on out, you're going to sort of not necessarily see them explicitly, but you'll see their kind of like strains running through everything we discuss. So try to keep them in your tool belt. Um, I think they'll help you think like a social psychologist. I think they'll help you keep the mm, social psychological perspective or mindset. 
um, sort of at the ready. Um, but you know, they're um, they're meant to kind of just help to capture what it is that uh, makes social psychology into social psychology. Okay, so now that we've invoked this specter of the scientific method, let's look that ghost right in the face. Um, this, the scientific method is designed to uh, reduce individual human bias as much as possible in the process of explaining the world around us. Uh, and the exact way that you articulate that system can differ a bit. Um, there's a few important points that basically everyone can agree on the way that i present this differs slightly from the textbook that will probably differ slightly from if you google this don't worry about that too much like uh, there are important things here and the important things here are going to shine through um you know uh, uh you you'll get the idea so uh, there's this sort of cycle of scientific practice and you know some like I said some people sort of define the steps here slightly differently it's it's that's not the important thing here you, you'll get you'll get the important bits um, so the first step is the sort of observation and the formulation of a, of a, of a research question um, this you know might look like you sort of observing something in the natural world and um, trying to formulate a question about it that you can study in a uh, research context uh, so for example uh, one of the first uh, psychological studies that I ever um, con conducted myself um, on my own uh, was based on the observation that some people really love absurd humor they find absurd humor to be like the optimal funniest most rewarding type of humor and other people seem to absolutely despise it find it disgusting and upsetting and threatening and it seemed to me like people had one of those reactions either sort of loving it or despising it uh and i formulated the research question you know something like what factors are most important in determining whether or not someone enjoys absurd humor something like that um so that was my research question and then i would generate hypotheses that hypothesis might be you know openness the the openness which is an aspect of your personality is the most important factor in determining appreciation for absurd humor such that people who are more open will enjoy absurd humor more than people who are less open something like that that's a hypothesis as it happens that was not the hypothesis that i specified that's just a simpler one that i came up with off the top of my head just then because it's easier um you can then take those hypotheses and you can test those hypotheses in a study um so you run a study uh looking at um how openness affects the appreciation for absurd humor i'm not going to describe that describe that in great detail because we're going to talk th about that topic a little bit more soon and then you'd interpret the results of that study. You'd, you'd sort of find a way for it to answer your research question in some way. It's worth noting that a single study is not going to answer a research question satisfactorily. Um, research questions and sort of the broader understanding of social phenomena um, are developed over time, over many, many studies, many people doing lots of different research, doing lots of different types of studies on lots of different samples. Um, but you know, this is sort of all part of it. And then you repeat, basically. Um, you might go back to the generate hypothesis test if you have new hypotheses, or you might go back to the observation or the research question steps if you want to sort of start from scratch, or you might just go back to the testing step if you wanted to sort of test the same hypotheses again to kind of like bolster your, um, uh, uh, your uh, confidence, sorry, uh, in those hypotheses. Um, and sometimes th what repeat means is like, not that you do it over and over again, but that other people do it over and over again. That's like a, this is an important part of the scientific process as well, is that like other scientists collaborate or replicate or whatever. Um, and something that happens naturally throughout this process is that you will build theory. Um, and theories are our explanations of the phenomena that we're studying. Um, and they should be able to sort of account for the results in the study that you obtained 
and they should also be able to account for how things work in the real world how things work in slightly different contexts that sort of thing your theory is your corner kind of story that you're able to tell that explains all of this um now this is a bit tricky because the word theory is sometimes used with a connotation that it's like just a guess or that it's incorrect or inaccurate or something like people will sometimes say the phrase well it's just a theory you know but in science theory is actually like the best we have um theories are the stories that we tell for explaining the facts that we've observed the facts in the natural world the facts in our research the like directly sort of uh, observable things <clears throat> and sometimes theories are proven wrong of course and almost always theories are updated over time that's part of the scientific process um that's unavoidable but it, it remains the case that theory is like the bread and butter um of science and theory building is ultimately often a large part of what many of us are striving for in science um so that's sort of part of this cycle of scientific practice is generating theories or adding to theories or updating theories to kind of build mm, broader understandings of uh of phenomena um and often you want these theories to be sort of applicable to novel contexts so someone else could take that theory that you generated and apply it to a new study to inform their their research questions and their expectations about a different study um so you know the, we're sort of talking all in the abstract here hopefully it's like clear but if it's not completely clear it should become clear over the course of this semester as like we talk more about actually specific theories or specific research and so on and so forth and now that we've spoken about the scientific method in general um, let's get a little bit more into the nitty-gritty uh, about how we actually test hypotheses um, so we're going to get into what might be familiar territory for some of you um, depending on which courses you've taken so far. Um, but I'm going to do my best to add a little bit of nuance to this discussion that you might not have encountered before, maybe. Um, so it is time to talk about correlational and experimental research. So for those of you who don't know, um, correlational and experimental methods are the sort of primary two ways in which we test hypotheses in science. Um, like like all methods can be kind of broken up into experimental and non-experimental methods basically um and correlational is just sort of a dominant form of non-experimental method uh so correlational methods are the ones in which we allow variables to um, behave normally um we, and then we observe them and uh test how they relate to one another without directly influencing or directly manipulating them and then experimental methods are when we intentionally manipulate one or more variables in order to test their effect uh, on one another. And um, these methods differ in a variety of ways, but the primary one is something you've probably heard before. Um, experimental methods can be used to provide evidence for causal relationships, um, whereas correlational methods cannot. And here we're going to encounter something of a bee in my bonnet. Um, so I'm going to go on a little bit of a sort of tangent slash rant um, that you'll just have to sort of go along with me for. Um, but the phrase correlation does not imply causation or, you know, correlation does not equal causation or whatever. You've probably encountered some variation of this phrase before because it tends to be repeated a lot in... Um, psychology undergraduate educations and so the idea here is that correlation on its own is not sufficient evidence to demonstrate a causal relationship between two variables it's possible that if you uh, observe an, uh, a correlation that x causes y or y causes x or some third variable z affects both x and y and this is true um, like this is a good lesson to learn um, it, it is indeed true that um, correlation alone is not sufficient to um, demonstrate a causal relationship uh, but I have some problems with this phrase because of how it ends up 
actually getting like taken up by students. Um, some undergrads have a kind of a bad habit of repeating this phrase mindlessly throughout their education. They either kind of like misapply the idea uh, or they use it kind of as if it's a criticism of research, like a, like if it's a critique itself. I've encountered it a lot in, in sort of other classes, um, in working one-on-one -on -one directly with uh, undergraduate students on research. Um, and it kind of it gets thrown around quite a, quite a bit, but in truth, like correlation is a necessary condition for causation. It's impossible to have a causal relationship that is not also correlational. If you switch on a light switch, for example, and the light comes on, and then you switch it off and it turns off, what you've done is you've demonstrated a causal relationship between the switch, the light switch, and the light. Right? That's a causal demonstration. But if you checked that room a hundred times over the course of a week, and each time you checked it, you noted the position of the light switch and whether the light uh, was on or off, you'd actually observe a perfect correlation. There is a perfect correlation between those two variables. And this is because causal relationships necessarily demonstrate correlational relationships. You cannot have a causal relationship without that correlational relationship. Now. Although the correlational relationship is necessary for a causal relationship, it is not sufficient. It is a necessary but not sufficient condition of causality. This means that um, we can't infer causality based on correlational evidence alone, right? So that is true. That, that, that lesson is still true, and it's worth learning that lesson. But it's also worth noting that we can never technically obtain causal evidence for like a lot of important problems. For example, does smoking cause lung cancer? Answer this question in your head for me now, please. Or answer it aloud if you, you know, want to speak to your laptop. I, I won't hear you, but I'll know. Um, probably most of you, if not all of you said, yes, smoking does cause lung cancer, but in truth, um, we don't know that, right? Like, we don't have causal evidence of that. I mean, we know it, in quotation marks, but we don't have causal evidence of it because we've never done an experimental study on it because it wouldn't be ethically right to randomly assign people to either smoke or not smoke and then measure whether or not they receive lung cancer. We only have correlational evidence on that. And in truth, correlational work makes up the majority of research in many fields out of necessity. Experimental work is often just logistically unfeasible, or it's ethically unfeasible, or it's just legitimately impossible to do. Like, it's genuinely impossible. Um, and that work, all that correlational work, is still important um, and valuable, and it, it makes up a huge part of a scientific method, um, observation and description, which are sort of you know, two very important steps in, um, in the sort of sci the, the way that science progresses over time. And, th like, the people who do this work, correlational work, very seldom mistakenly attribute causality to their work. Like, like very seldom do they ever make the claim that they've demonstrated causality when, in fact, all they've demonstrated is correlation. That doesn't really happen. Those sorts of misunderstandings might happen among undergraduates or lay people, but most researchers won't make that particular error. I don't know that I've ever even really seen that error made by a researcher. Correlational work makes up a huge part of how we understand psychological relationships like as they exist in the real world, and arguably that's one of the most important things a psychologist can do. So, I don't know. Just saying correlation does not imply causation, that's not a, like a critique of a work. Like That's not a genuine criticism of that work, unless that work incorrectly claims that it has demonstrated causality, which is exceedingly rare. So not demonstrating causality is not itself a weakness or like a criticism of a body of work. So yeah, sorry, no, I went on for a long time there, but kind of just be careful in how you deploy this particular truism. Some of you are probably still early in your degrees and maybe it's, maybe there's still time for you. Maybe I've caught you before you've um, kind of become too obsessed with uh, uh, this, this, this truism um, because like I said uh, for some reason it just really gets hammered home for uh, psychology students and they end up applying it as if it's a criticism or they end up just misunderstanding how like empirical work is conducted which is to say primarily in correlational ways <laughs> um, yeah don't you know just don't put learn its lesson 
and then move on. Don't put too much emphasis on it, or you'll end up misunderstanding its purpose and what it tells us about research. Okay, yes, all right. Um, the, the the last thing I'll say about these, um, these two methods, uh, like, they'll come up throughout the semester, um, so I don't need to sort of explore them in, in totality right now. We're going to talk about them when we talk about research. Um, is that experiment actually has a, like, very strict definition um most of the time when you're saying or when you're like talking about a research study you should probably just say study don't say experiment unless you know for a fact that it's an experiment all experiments are studies but very few studies are experiments an experiment is a very specific thing it's when a researcher takes a variable x manipulates that variable in a systematic and randomly assigned way that's important I'll come back to that in a second and checks how it influences another variable y and um, you know here if I could I would ask you live sort of you know generated experiment for me or tell me the difference or I'd ask you an experiment and then or I describe a study and ask you whether it was experimental or not experimental but we can't do that so I'll just sort of give you a couple of examples. Uh, so if I took students into the lab and I measured how uncertain they were feeling, and then I asked them whether um, they would like to read a horror short story or a romance short story, and I measured that, like which, which one they'd rather read, that would be correlational. I'm uh, looking at the relationship between uncertainty, the experience of uncertainty, and uh, genre preference in fiction. And I'm allowing both of those variables, uncertainty and genre preference, to vary naturally on their own. I'm allowing them to sort of just take their natural um, association or relationship that exists in the world. Um, but instead, if I had taken those students into the lab and then I randomly assigned them to either receive um, a high uncertainty induction or a low uncertainty induction, this means I sort of create the sense of uncertainty for them, right? So I randomly assign them to either be in the high uncertainty condition and be given a sort of state of high uncertainty or the low uncertainty condition and given them the sort of state of low uncertainty. And then I measured which story they'd rather read, the romance or the horror story. That would be an experiment because I am controlling the variable uncertainty and I'm randomly assigning people to um, levels of the variable and I'm sort of uh, manipulating that variable in a systematic way with random assignment and then I'm measuring its effect on some other variable genre preference in fiction um, and in this case um, that, that, that would be sort of like enough to generate evidence for uh, a causal effect you know I could say that causally people who are uh, uh, the, the, the experience of uncertainty makes people more willing to read romance short stories if that was what I found you know whatever it doesn't matter you, you see what I'm saying hopefully okay um, so it's really important to understand this difference um, like between these the, these different types of research methods um, partly because experiments have uh, several methodological differences that like need to be respected that I just kind of mentioned um, but also because as we just kind of discussed like the theoretical implications of experimental and non-experimental work are very different okay we talked about that a lot do you hopefully get it at this point and if you don't we're going to learn more about it throughout the semester so you know you, you'll get this hopefully all right let's go over what we've learned today so uh first we learned that uh social psychology is kind of broadly speaking the scientific study of people's thoughts feelings and behaviors regarding themselves and the actual imagined or implied presence of others um we discussed uh it's it's relationship social psychology's relationship to to other disciplines and also its sort of historical trajectory um, and in particular we discussed how it most demonstrates a social cognitive perspective th these days and that sort of sees humans as being social information processing machines um, we also discussed how the other historical influences and perspectives remain influential to this day um, and I'm not going to list all those again but you know 
hopefully you remember them or you can go back to them uh next we talked about the four ish four sort of assumptions that make up social psychology and kind of define and distinguish social psychological thinking and i you know again i want you to kind of keep an eye on these and try to identify them in the content uh over the rest of the semester because i kind of think they're gonna keep cropping up and after that we talked about the scientific method um and we talked about how we apply it specifically in experimental and correlational forms of uh research and we talked about how both of these are uh, necessary and important aspects of psychology um, and uh, sort of about what their of contributions and their limitations uh, of each of those methods are. Okay, so um, this is the sort of first half or part one of your lectures today. Your lectures are sometimes going to be presented in a single video. Other times they'll be presented in two videos. In this case, it's two videos because... Um, the other lecture is a guest lecture, um, but sometimes it might just be two lectures because I felt like splitting them up for whatever reason, a break or to make editing easier or whatever. Um, before your guest lecture, uh, I'm going to do uh, something that I've done before in uh, this class and I got good feedback on it. People liked it uh, or sorry people told me they liked it in an anonymous feedback form <laughs> they may have been lying um uh and um this is uh just media recommendations um i like to use uh social psychology to understand or psychology in general i guess to understand media and i like to use media to understand psychology i think that the two play very well uh with one another and a big part of how we think about uh, humans is through stories um and so too with uh psychology so um these are not mandatory you do not have to watch read play whatever all of the things that i'm going to kind of recommend um throughout the semester they're meant to be fun you can take them as you will uh <laughs> so uh if you if you enjoy them great if you don't don't worry about it if you um if you check out one of the things i recommend and you have feelings about it definitely let me know i'd be i'd be curious to hear what you think even if you hate it um or, or, you know, how it makes you feel about the uh, material in the course. Uh, okay, so um, I've got a few recommendations here for you today. The first is a movie called Arrival. Um, this movie is uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve, who also um, directed Blade Runner 2049 um, and uh, a handful of other good movies. Um, and this movie deals with lots of things of grand uh psychological interest memory language communication self-perception and sort of uh autobiographical narrative um it's a really interesting and strange and beautiful movie um and it's based on a uh, short story by a sci-fi author named ted chiang uh who's who's quite good um so i'd recommend checking out this movie it's 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 really great um the next recommendation is a novel um published or written by the uh canadian author robertson davies um robertson davies has the um sort of unique distinction of being uh in my opinion the author who is best at capturing uh the canadian spirit and the canadian character um and this book <clears throat> fifth business is the first in a trilogy that i think does an excellent job of capturing the canadian character uh the the trilogy is called the deptford trilogy because the books sort of broadly speaking take place in and around a small fictional ontario town called deptford um it's fifth business is is about um <laughs> it's one of those books that's about people uh and it's about you know human interactions and the sort of broad uh <laughs> the vagaries that that entails um and in particular it's about <clears throat> a uh, uh an academic who's from a small town in ontario who moves to toronto and uh works at the university of toronto um and I won't say a lot more about it than that, partly because the plot's difficult to explain, but also partly because it's more about sort of experiencing things. But, you know, it deals with human interaction in, a, in 
I think, a very interesting way, but it also deals with culture in a very interesting way. And like I said, it has the unique distinction of being, in my opinion, the best cultural exploration of Canada that I have ever read in a novel. Um, oh, also, uh, there are a bunch of plaques around downtown Toronto that reference Robertson Davies, um, like places where he lived or places where he like um, taught, those sorts of things. So he's an interesting guy in general. He was a big figure at the University of Toronto throughout the 20th century. Okay, um, next recommendation, also a book. Uh, these aren't always going to be books. I, I recommend lots of different types of media. It just so happens that I, you know, leaned a bit heavy on the reading this week. Um, is The Left Hand of Darkness. This is um, a sci-fi novel by uh, uh, one of the most important, uh, important authors in science fiction and fantasy, in my opinion, Ursula Le Guin. Everything she writes is excellent. A uh, strong, strong re recommendation. Um, but this book in particular is uh, an exploration of culture and gender um, in one of the most unique ways I've, I've ever seen. Um, it takes place on an alien planet, um, and it's about the sort of interaction between humans and alien organisms that resemble humans very closely, except for in some crucial ways, and those crucial ways deal primarily with things like um, gender and sexual reproduction. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting sort of exploration of um, yeah, it's sort of like a combination of character study, politics, um, uh, intergalactic politics as well, but also just sort of um, gender, gender expression, gender politics, gender as it relates to culture and so on. Excellent, excellent book. Strong recommendation. Uh, and then finally, here's sort of a curveball um, um, recommendation um, because it is a comic book. Um, this is a recent set of X-Men comic books. Hold on, hear me out. Don't turn off the video yet. Um, uh, despite what you might think about X Men, X Men is not typically these days a story about like heroes fighting like a bad guy or something. Um, X Men kind of gets thrown into the superhero genre, but it often, the comics at least, don't necessarily embody the superhero genre very well. This is because it's often not a power fantasy at all. It's not an individualist fantasy. It is about collective struggle of marginalized groups fighting for respect and power in a world that refuses to give them to give them either of those things. And these comics these it's two different titles but they're basically one title you sort of read them together um they're called house of x powers of 10 um they specifically embody this idea of a group that has been historically incredibly vulnerable fighting for and asserting um their power and role in the world um i think that this is uh one of the best comics uh ever written in the, in this sort of like superhero genre um and it's also a good place to jump in because it's meant to be sort of like a soft reboot like it's meant to be a place that newcomers can jump in so i don't know if you're curious you can google this more or like ask me for specifics about it but if you've ever been curious about reading uh x-men house of x powers of 10 is an excellent place to jump in you just need to kind of google it to make sure you understand um the like the way that you read it but yeah anyways um, that's my that's my uh, X-Men recommendation. I probably won't make many more uh, <laughs> recommendations that are that kind of uh, specific. Anyways, um, that's it for this week. Uh, enjoy uh, the uh, guest lecture on culture. Um, we probably actually cover, th this has probably been longer this week than in, in total ta totality anyways, than it will be most weeks. Sorry about that. Um, but, you know, uh, it'll be all right. Um, and I'll see you next week. Thanks so much, everyone, and goodbye.